You know, it's, I'm very blessed that my parents attend church here. Uh, it's still just strange to me to look out and see my mom and dad here. And um, I'm very blessed. They, they drive down all the way from Anderson every Sunday to come to Warren. And, uh, but I'm going to tell a story. My dad may remember this. So when I was young, um, we had a lot of neighborhood guys, and I used to ride uh, BMX bikes, if you know those bikes. And uh, one time I thought I'd be a professional BMX racer. That was kind of weird. But anyways, there was a gas station that we would go to, and we found out that if you put a nickel, it was a quarter back then for a Coke, you know, it was extremely expensive. And, but we found out if you put a nickel and hit the thing, it would give you a Coke. So we'd go put our nickel in and hit it, and now we'd get a Coke. I thought that was the coolest thing ever, you know. So I remember one day as a dumb kid, I told my dad, hey dad, guess what? You can go to the Amico station and put a nickel in the machine and hit it and get you a, co and get you a Coke. I thought my dad would be excited about that amazing good news. My dad said, nope, <clears throat> you follow me. He put me in the car and drove me to the Amico gas station. We found the manager and I had to tell the manager that we had been stealing from them. <laughs> so after 30 days in prison, no, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go to jail. But that taught me a life lesson, be honest. Be honest, do not steal. Uh, and probably for better or for worse, money just doesn't appeal to me that much. You can give me $1,000 and tell me put it in the church safe, and I'm going to put it in the church safe. I have no desire to take any of that money. And, but my dad taught me a hard lesson that day. And you know, there's a lot of life lessons we can probably look back. As you look back in your life and you, you see things that you've learned over the years in life lessons. I was, last night, sometimes the Lord does this. I, 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 this is the third time I've rewritten this sermon. And uh, last night after our game night, I got home and it's like God said, nope, you're not going to preach that one. Sit down and write another one. So, so I was doing some research last night. And I ran across Inc.com. It's, a, I believe, a magazine for entrepreneurs. And it was talking about life lessons for people. And, and I, I thought these were pretty good. I'm going to share with you some life lessons. And maybe you agree with this. Make yourself necessary and you will always be needed. My dad taught me that one too. When I, when I moved to Indiana, he said, learn every job in the place and you become indispensable. And so one of the things I do is oftentimes I will... Try to, hey, teach me how to do this, teach me how to do this. Because the more you can do, the more indispensable you become. Here is another one. Your thoughts are like boomerangs. What you pass along to others is what will always come back to you. It's a thought. Here's another one. You are most defined by what comes out of your mouth than what goes in it. The way you speak and the things you say have power. Speech gives us the power to create or destroy. You know, the Bible says that, right? Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Wisdom is knowing when not to say nothing. That is wisdom. The journey, here's another one. The journey of success will always begin with a small step of taking a chance, which is true. In business, in relationships, and in life, it begins with a small step grounded in the desire to do better and better. You know, as I look out at Warren Baptist Church, and I just... I know some of y'all probably get tired of hearing this, but you know, we were told this church would not survive, that this church could not reach this community. That was nine years ago. Look at us today. Right after worship, amen. <clears throat> right after we move out, our Hispanic congregation will be coming in. Then right after they move out, our Haitian congregation that we just started will be coming in. So I see how God is using us to reach the community, and that's because we said we're not going to quit. We're going to take small steps, and we did. And sometimes it took many years before we saw anything happen. But look at what God is doing today. Your education is never complete. Determined to live fully and continually learn. Always be a learner. I honestly have no room for people that don't want to learn anymore. Don't allow the voice of your fears to be louder than the other voices in your head. And we all battle those voices, right? And sometimes we can allow the voice of fear to overwhelm us that we don't do 
things and step out. Because we're afraid, what happens if I don't make it? Look, I have failed a lot of times. And some of those failures have hurt, big time, financially and others. I've failed, but I've learned, tried to learn. John Maxwell, a leadership guru, wrote a book called Failing Forward. He said, every time you fall down, pick something up on your way back up. Here's something else. A good reputation is more valuable than money. It's true. You never really lose until you stop trying. The words, I can't, will never accomplish anything. In fact, I'll tell you that usually when we say, I can't, what we really mean is, I won't. True. When we usually say, I can't, really what we're saying is, I won't do that. You get more by giving more. Amen? You give and God gives. You know, our clothing closet, we've been going every week. We'll be doing that till Labor Day. And honestly, there were times I was like, are we going to run out of clothes? We have not ran out of clothes yet. Every time we give clothes away, more clothes show up on our doorstep. We just can't, you can't outgive God. And it's amazing. Here's another one. Rule your mind or it will rule you. The battle's in here. That's where the battle is in our heads. Give heroes, great heroes are truly humble. That's true. Great heroes are truly humble people. Defeat isn't bitter if you're smart enough not to swallow it. At one time or another, we all experience failure. In fact, the more we are willing to risk, the more we will fail. You know, we have to be willing to fail. Your thoughts are powerful. Make them positive. Another great thought. Forgiveness benefits two people. And we could go on and on and on. So maybe, maybe you've written down some life lessons. I would challenge you to write down some life lessons. Because as we go through this life, we're all going to learn things. And the worst thing is never to learn from your mistakes. Not to repeat your mistakes. So do you, do you like some of those life lessons? Makes sense, maybe. Hopefully you agree with them. Maybe you disagree. What are some of the life lessons you've learned? Maybe, have you ever written those down? And the question I was thinking about on life lessons was, who can teach life lessons? And I would argue anybody can teach you a life lesson. You can learn a life lesson from anybody. It might be a mentor that you look up to, a parent, a grandparent, might be a teacher, a professor. It could even be a criminal. We can learn life lessons for everybody. So if you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 23. And we're going to look at some lessons from two criminals this morning. And Jesus has been found guilty by the religious leaders for blasphemy. Then the religious leaders turned around and they lied. They told Pilate that Jesus was trying to mislead the people and opposing payment to taxes, which wasn't true. Pilate saw through the lies. He said, this man is innocent. So that's when they cranked up the emotions. And they started having the people yell, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate, of course, was afraid that there was going to be an uprising. So he says, okay, you can, you can take him. So they beat Jesus. They whip Jesus. They mock Jesus. And then they give him the cross beam, of course, to carry. Jesus collapses under the weight of that beam. So they force a man from Cyrene named Simon to carry Jesus' cross. And today we're introduced to two more people at the crucifixion. Now, we don't know these guys' names. Unlike Simon, we don't know their names. We don't know, like we know the women that were at the cross because they're named, but we don't know who these criminals are. All we know is they're criminals. And let's see what we can learn from these guys. And honestly, I want to say this. These are simple life lessons. And I was thinking about this this morning before I came out to preach. A lot of us who've been in church, I've been saved for 52 years. Woo. Amen. Amen. <laughs> a lot of us who, we've been in church, we've heard hundreds if not thousands of messages on the crucifixion. And it's real easy for us to get numb to the crucifixion of Christ. And I know for me personally, a challenge is not to allow myself to get numb to what's happening here on the cross. 
And Brother Jerome's going to be speaking a lot about more of that next week. But let me give you some lessons from these criminals. First of all, let's take a look at the passage here. Luke chapter 23, we'll start at verse 32. It says, two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. And then when they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the left. Now, what is crucifixion? According to the National Institute of Health, crucifixion was probably developed by the Babylonians, and then later it was really popular in Iran, uh, Persia in the 6th century. Then it was imported by Alexander the Greek, Great, and the Greeks started using it. And, uh, but the Romans really perfected crucifixion. The Romans used crucifixion for about 500 years to kill people. If you know, what they would do is they would nail you to a cross or tie you to a cross. And usually, death would occur in about six hours up to four days. So people would hang on these crosses sometimes for days. And when you're hung like that, the only way you can breathe is to pull up. So Jesus, every time he breathed, those nails would go deeper and rip against his flesh. And the nails in his feet would rip his feet every time he tried to breathe. And eventually, what happens, most people died of cardiac arrest. Their body, just, their heart just simply gave out. You think, why would they do this? This was horrible. Crucifixion is the most humiliating way to kill people. You would walk into cities and there would be crosses lined with criminals out there being crucified. And contrary to what you see, they don't have clothes on. They're stripped naked, usually have been beaten, and they're hanging out there in the hot sun, roasting in the sun. And it was extremely humiliating. Now the Romans rarely ever executed Romans. They hardly ever would crucify a Roman. Who would they crucify? It was usually low-life criminals. It was usually slaves. Slaves that had run away from their masters and then been caught or caught stealing. And usually they were crucified. Why would they crucify the slaves? To deter the other slaves from running away. Right? Sometimes they would crucify enemies of the state. It could be a soldier that defected or somebody that's trying to lead a rebellion. By the way, Barabbas, who they want to release... He was up for crucifixion. Why? Because he tried to lead a rebellion against the state. Only rarely did they actually crucify Roman citizens. Crucifixion was a warning. Don't. You know, today we have a lot, long times, a long process of people being, um, going through the process. And, And there's good to that. But also, sometimes I think there's bad to it. If you were in Indianapolis and you pulled into 21st Street and you saw people hanging on a cross for stealing, do you think you'd think twice before you stole? Oh, yeah. If you saw people out there roasting in the sun because they murdered somebody, would you think twice before you pulled a trigger? Oh, yeah. And so this was a great deterrent, and it was the most humiliating way to die. In fact, a lot of times the Romans did not have a lengthy trial process like we do. They convicted you, and you went out to the cross. You didn't sit in jail for months and years of going through an appeals process. You went to the cross. So apparently these criminals, which we see twice they're called criminals, somehow they fell short of the law. The law said don't steal. Somehow they, they, may have they, maybe they stole. We don't know exactly why they're there. The law said do not murder. Maybe they murdered. Let me give you a life lesson from this. We are criminals compared to God. When you put us up against God, all of us fall short of God. You know, if I had a white, if that screen was white and I put a little black dot in the center, what would you see? The black dot. That's us. No matter how good you are, when you put yourself against God, the background of purity... We always, always fall short. 
And, 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 you know, and, and I think this is something that people just don't grasp. There's, there's a, a guy that I think his name's Ray Comfort, and he does these interviews with people, and I guess he gets permission to film them. And he'll go up to him and say, are you a good person? Now, what do most people say? Yeah, I'm a pretty good person. He goes, have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Yeah. He said, what if you die and you're standing before God? I want you all to think about this. And God judges you according to the Ten Commandments. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah. Have you ever stolen from your employer or something that wasn't yours, taken something that wasn't yours? Yeah. Have you ever, you know, have you ever murdered? Well, no, I've never murdered. Good on that one. Did you know that Jesus said that if you hate somebody, you're guilty of murder as far as God's concerned? Okay. Have you ever committed adultery? No, I've never committed adultery. Have you ever lusted? Well, yeah. Jesus said anybody that lusts in their hearts, guilty of committing adultery. And if you I mean, think about that, if, if, if you're saying I'm a good person and you stand before God and God judges you by the Ten Commandments, have you ever taken the name of the Lord your God in vain? I think most people have. If we were judged just by the Ten Commandments, we would all fall short. We all do. And it's interesting that when I watch him take people through this, you can see they go from thinking they're a good person to, I'm in trouble. I'm in serious trouble. Because if God's going to judge me, and he is, I'm in serious trouble. You know, I don't know how these guys became criminals. But did you know that we become criminals compared to God by sinning in two ways? One way we sin is by the sin of commission. We deliberately do what we know is wrong. You deliberately tell the lie. You deliberately look at those things on the internet you shouldn't be looking at. You deliberately steal from somebody. You deliberately commit adultery or whatever. You deliberately do it. That's the sin of commission, and all of us are guilty of that. There's also another type of sin. Do you know what that is? The sin of omission. The sin of omission is not something that you necessarily do consciously, but you still subconsciously sin against God. You know, here's, here's one way James said it. It is sin to know the good and not yet to do it. Let me give you an example. The parable of the Good Samaritan. You all know the story? The priest walks by. What does the priest do? Nothing. He goes to the other side of the road. What should the priest have done? Should have helped the man. That's the sin of omission. He failed to do the good that he was supposed to do. The Levite walked by. What did he do? Nothing. He had to go. Again, the sin of omission. Matthew chapter 25. Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats. And basically the goats are people that he they says, Jesus, like, when did you help my, love, my brothers of mine? You know, you saw me naked. You saw us thirsty. What did you do? Nothing. That's the sin of omission. Omission is failing to do the good that we know that we ought to do. And every one of us is guilty. Everyone. There is no one who does good. No, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned to our own ways. There is no one who seeks after God. We're all criminals. Now, if that offends you, sorry. True. We're criminals compared to God. All of us fall short. Now, again, I, I want to warn you because I know a lot of us have been in church for years and maybe I know all this. I get it, but I want you to revisit it. Next lesson, we all need forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. So the criminals are hanging on the cross and they hear Jesus say, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. Who is he asking Father to forgive? The religious leaders who unjustly had him convicted? The people who are blindly following the religious leaders? The soldiers who have nailed him to the cross? And are there mocking him and enjoying killing another Jew? Why does Jesus ask the Father to forgive them? 
they don't know what they're doing. They do not know who they are killing. They are crucified. The Jews are crucifying their Savior, the one that's been prophesied. They're crucifying the long awaited Messiah. Were these people at the cross committing the sins of commission or omission? I would say both. They were willingly having Jesus crucified. And at the same time, they were failing to do what they should have done. Not had him crucified. Either way, Jesus is asking the Father to forgive them. And you know what? Jesus asked the Father, and Father will forgive us of both sins of commission and omission. I'm glad about that. I'm glad that we're forgiven of all sins when we turn and trust Christ. Let me give you another life lesson from these criminals. Another one is we naturally reject Jesus. We naturally reject Jesus. Let's look at verse 35. <clears throat> the people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. Have you ever noticed when you're watching TV shows how the name Jesus is used as a curse word? Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed how people will say Christ as a curse word? Have you ever noticed how people will use the name God as a curse word? You know, I've noticed I've never heard anybody on a TV show say, oh, Muhammad. Never heard it. I've never heard a person stub their toe and say, Hare Krishna. Never heard it. Never said, oh, Confucius. Never heard it. But I always hear, oh, Jesus. Oh, Christ. You know what that says to me? We are in a spiritual war. And Satan wants to negate the truth. And the truth is Jesus. Amen. Satan wants to cheapen the name of Jesus. And the name of Christ. And the name of God. And that's why, in these halls, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. They just think it's a word. But it's Satan wanting to inspire them to say these words. And I watch these shows, I'm like, why did you say that? There was no need for that. But you hear it over and over and over again. You know, if Allah, now let me, listen carefully. If Allah were the true God, you know what Satan would be having people say? Oh, Allah trying to denigrate the name. But they don't. Why? Because God is the true God. Allah is not God. You will hear people tell you Allah and God are the same. No, they are not. Muhammad is not superior to Jesus. He was a fornicating man. He was not a believer. He is not superior to Christ. And I just notice how people today scoff and ridicule the crucifixion. Many years ago, there was a famous artwork of a crucifix of Jesus in a jar of urine. And that was called art. Many people felt like the opening ceremony of the Olympics, that one scene, was a mockery of the Last Supper. I read about the comedy team of Penn and Teller. And I, actually, I kind of like some of those magic shows. I, I kind of like that stuff. It's fun. I mean, I'm talking just tricks. I'm not talking the, I'm just talking. I'm amazed at how people can manipulate things and hide things in their hands. But in 2003, both Penn and Teller, who are both avowed atheists, performed a stunt where they parodied the crucifixion of Jesus at a magician's convention. In fact, many magicians walked out on it. In the skit that was performed in Las Vegas, Teller was dressed up as Christ on a full-size cross entering the room on a cart. According to the, the story, a midget, a small person, a little person, this is how the article says, a little person dressed as an angel performed, performed acts on Teller. I'm not going to say any more than that. Simulated. Disgusting acts. Penn, who's the big guy, he was dressed as a Roman gladiator and he, veiled, he unveiled the scene by pulling away the shroud of Turin that covered the cross. An open mockery of the crucifixion of Jesus. 
And sadly, most people still reject Jesus. That's a life lesson I've learned. Most people still reject Jesus. You know, Jesus said this, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. Most people, unfortunately, go down the broad road. <clears throat> How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Again, I hear people, you know, you share with them the gospel, and they'll say, well... When I get to heaven, I'll talk to God. You ain't going to say nothing. Have you read Job 38? Job said, I want to have an audience with God. And God comes in Job 38 and says, all right, let's have a conversation. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Where were you when I did this? Where? And Job's like, I don't have anything to say. I'm done. It's going to happen. You're not going to tell God anything. Many people say, I've been a good person. We've already seen that. Compared to God, nobody's good. I deserve to go to heaven. Nobody deserves anything. It's a life lesson. And I, I hate it, you know. Many people that you share the gospel with just walk away. And maybe they'll later become followers of Christ. That's always our prayer, right? And we're called to share the gospel. But a lot of people just, I don't want God. I want to do my own thing. And that breaks my heart. And it breaks God's heart. Here's another lesson. We are powerless to save ourselves. That's kind of what I just said earlier. Look at this. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at Jesus. So now one of them's insulting Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? So apparently he had maybe heard of Jesus before. Save yourself and us. What's he admitting? He's powerless. He can't get off the cross. Again, your hands are tied. Your feet are nailed. You can't move. He's totally powerless. They're nailed to the cross. They're surrounded by trained Roman soldiers. They have nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. And what does he do? Instead of, instead of humbly responding to Jesus, he mocks him. And what does he want Jesus to do? Save me. Get me off this cross. He wants Jesus to save his physical life, not his soul. Because all he thinks about is Jesus. We are powerless to save ourselves. You know, all of us have a sin debt against God that we can't pay. You know? It's like going on trial at the court, and I know nobody speeds out here on 465, but supposing you did. And you stand before the judge, and the judge says, your fine is $10 billion. Anybody got $10 billion? I didn't think so. If you do, please tithe. 10% would be one. No. We're standing before the judge. We owe $10 billion. I don't have it. We're all powerless. We simply cannot pay the debt we owe God. And that goes to the next life lesson. We will be judged by God. Again, that, again I know people don't like this. This doesn't play well. It doesn't give you the feel goods, but it's the truth. We will all stand before God. The other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God? This guy gets it. Since you are undergoing the same punishment... Hey, we're all in the same boat together up here. Don't you get it? We are punished justly. We broke the law. We got caught. We fell short because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. This guy got it. He knew Jesus was unjustly on the cross. You know, in America, we constantly hear about injustice in America. There's injustice in every country around the world. You know why? Because we're all sinners. There's injustice everywhere. It doesn't mean it's okay. I'm just saying it exists everywhere. And it, it's always interesting to me how we have millionaire politicians pontificating how they're going to make life fair for everybody. And I'm looking at them like, well, how did you get so rich? A lot of times politicians will make laws to make everything fair. It's interesting. I found a, an article on ProPublica. And it's titled, Do As We Say, Congress Says, and Then What It Wants. And it talks about in the article several things that Congress exempts itself from. For example, the Age Discrimination Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and others require employers to retain personal records. But a, a recent report on the Congressional Workplace notes, quote, Congress has exempted itself from all these requirements. Congress is also exempt from keeping records of injuries and, illness, and illnesses 
the way private sector companies are. Now, maybe they've changed that, but when this was written, they went through a list of things that Congress says, good for you, but not for us. Injustice. We all cry out for injustice. We want justice, right? We don't want injustice. That's why I'm looking forward to Jesus coming back, because he's going to right every wrong, amen? I'm looking forward to that day. And you know, that brings the question, why didn't Jesus come down off the cross? Why didn't he say, yeah, watch this, guys, and call 10,000 angels? You know, one angel killed 185,000 people in the Old Testament. 10,000 of them, ain't a chance. He could have wiped out the entire Roman Empire with a word, but he didn't. Why? Because he had to defeat something more important than physical. He had to defeat the spiritual. He had to pay the price and satisfy God's justice. You know, Peter wrote this, Christ also suffered for sins once for all. The righteous, that's Christ for the unrighteous. Why? That he might bring you to God. <clears throat> that's why Christ suffered, to bring us to God. John said this, any, Jesus said this in John, anyone who believes in him, speaking of himself, is not condemned. In other words, you don't have to pay for your sins if you believe in Christ. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. We are all going to be judged. The writer of Hebrews says it's appointed for people to die once. And after this, the judgment. Here's another life lesson. We have a choice. As long as you and I are alive, we have a choice. So what does the thief say to Jesus, the criminal? He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Two criminals, both convicted of crimes, both being crucified, both watching Jesus die, both hearing the words coming out of Jesus' mouth, both observing the events around him, both with the same knowledge and apparently some prior knowledge, but only one says, please remember me. We have a choice. We can accept or reject Jesus. There is a very prominent doctrine being taught in our Southern Baptist churches, which I'm standing against, called Calvinism, that says you cannot choose to respond to Jesus. God chose who was going to be saved before he created the world, and therefore you are unable to respond unless God chose you. I can't find one verse in the Bible that teaches that. What I hear in the Bible is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn. That's what I read. And unfortunately, though, a lot of my fellow ministers believe the opposite. So part of my task is taking them to task when it's appropriate. Jesus said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the last lesson is we can enjoy paradise for eternity. Man, I'm looking forward to that. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Wow. Can you imagine going from a cross where you're getting roasted and you're bleeding and suffocating death and you finally close your eyes in death and you wake up in glory? I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to it. Not sweaty, not aching. I'm looking forward to just worshiping God with my brothers and sisters in glory. That's the blessed hope. And I'm looking forward to that day when we're on the new earth. We have, an, as Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has planned for us. We really can't fathom what's coming, but we know it's coming. And Jesus says, because you believe, you're believing against all odds. But as this man watched Jesus and heard Jesus, this man said, this man must be the son of God. Will you remember me? And Jesus said, yes, today you will be with me in paradise. And the question is, have you learned these lessons? Have you learned these lessons? This is life and death. Unfortunately, I've preached a lot of funerals. Death is part of life. I hate it. I absolutely hate death. I hate death, but it's part of our life. But I know this, when a believer passes from death, Jesus says you'll pass from death unto life. You'll pass from this world with all of its wars and injustice and 
pain and all the junk in this world to a life in paradise. I look forward to that day. Amen. Oh, yes, amen, because I am. And when you all get to heaven, just meet me at the coffee shop. It's called Hebrews. Just think about it. Hebrews. Anyways, I don't know. <laughs> Jerome gave me the thumb down. I can't wait for that day. And we're not going to float around on clouds for eternity playing harps. One day we're going to be on the new earth because we're designed to live in bodies. We're not designed to live in heaven. And one day we will live on the new earth where we'll create works of art, beauty, music. Love will be unhindered. It will be glorious. I can't completely understand all of it, but I can't wait for it. But, you know, the truth of the matter is to get to that point, all you have to do is say, I surrender. Yes, yes. Right. Lord, save me. That's, that's the hardest life lesson for so many people. It is not worth spending eternity having to pay for your sins because you wouldn't bow your knee. It's not God's will that anybody should perish. That's why Calvinism has another issue. It's, God, it's not God's will that anybody should go to hell but that all should come to repentance. God wants all people to come to faith in Him. He hasn't chosen who's going to be saved and who's not. No, He wants all people to come to faith in Him. Everybody has a choice. What's yours going to be? Let's pray. Father, it's my prayer that everybody in this room at some point in their life has bowed their knee and said, Lord, save me. I admit it, I've rebelled against you, I'm a criminal compared to you, I am no good, there's nothing good in me. But you died for me, and you, you've offering me this forgiveness, and so I accept it. I accept your forgiveness, save me, come into my heart, I will follow you wherever you go. Lord, if there's somebody watching online or somebody in this room that has never bowed their knee to you, has never had that moment when they said, yes, Lord, please save me, that today, right now, they'll do it. That they'll give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. And Father, if they took that step, that they'll be willing to let us celebrate with Him because we're just going to celebrate together. Because there's joy in heaven when one sinner repents. And we want to join that celebration. So Father, as we sing this morning, maybe there's somebody, you're, they feel that conviction in your heart, they feel that grip in their heart, it's because they've never repented and turned to you that today they will repent and turn to you. That's your desire because you love them. You don't want them to have to spend eternity apart from you. But your justice will not allow it unless they repent. So God, I pray this morning that we will all learn this important life lesson. We need you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.